I'm pleased to welcome each of you to this artist interview series, which is in conjunction with the exhibition Prison Nation at the Davis Museum at Wellesley College. Prison Nation is organized by the Aperture Foundation in New York. Nicole R. Fleetwood and Michael Famagetti are the curators. Aperture's Prison Nation exhibition was made possible with lead support from the Ford Foundation. And additional generous support was provided by the Reba Judith Sandler Foundation. And in today's interview, we have the opportunity to learn more about the work of artist Nigel Poor. Hi, I'm Nigel Poor. Um, I am a, a visual artist. I've been working as an artist for about 30 years. I'm also a professor of photography at California State University, Sacramento. In 2011, I started volunteering at San Quentin State Prison in California through an educational program called the Prison University Project. Um, and I started teaching history of photography class which I did for about three semesters. Um, from there, I got very interested and drawn into other prison issues. And I started volunteering inside the media lab in San Quentin, where I started a radio program. And out of that in 2016, grew the podcast Ear Hustle, um, which I co-created with Erlon Woods and Antoine Williams, who were both incarcerated at San Quentin at the time. And that's pretty much what I do now is, is podcasting about life in prison. Hi, my name is Carlos. I am a formerly incarcerated individual. Um, I served four and a half out of a six year sentence, got out early because of good behavior. Um, I'm currently working with Black and Pink Massachusetts as the inside aid organizer. So I do a lot of advocacy stuff um, and outreach for those who are currently incarcerated. And I got invited to do this through the Black and Pink organization when I just first came home. So I'm very happy to be able to participate, uh, participate and kind of, you know, help give a different perspective on what uh, the work that Nigel has done, which I find to be very impressive and enheartening for those who are incarcerated. Hi, I'm Ryan. I'm currently a junior at Wellesley College and I've been an SBA, a student visitor assistant at the Davis for three years now. I'm assuming that this, this photograph, I don't know if you know the story, is this just the school visiting the facility. That's my first question for Nigel. Okay. Well, um, Carlos, I, I, was, I was really curious as to why someone would choose this particular photograph. So one of the things about the archive is there is so much that is not known about it. Um, okay. It, so it, when, I, when I got my hands on it, it, it was inside these large banker boxes, completely unorganized. Um, and so there's a lot of things I can't answer, but what I can tell you about this is this was actually a school that was on site at the prison for the children of people who worked at the prison. And it okay. was a very small, it was like a one room classroom. And so all of the, all of the students, I, I don't know what ages they are. They look like they're, you know, maybe second grade up into high school. They were all together in one classroom. I had actually initially chosen this picture because I'm originally from Boston. And part of the curriculum is we actually take field trips to the Supreme Judicial Courtroom, uh, Suffolk County. We've actually visited Suffolk County lockup. And I actually initially thought perhaps that's what one of these was, was a field trip to the facility. And what I just found completely um, astounding was one was the lack of diversity. Um, this happens to be, I'm a biracial individual. And one of the first things I picked up was that this appears to be mostly all white children. Um, and from that, it was just very interesting that into, I mean, this is 1958. So this yeah. is the, these are our baby boomers. Now, these are our 70 year olds now who one for me, I pick up on the fact that these are children, like these are parents whose children may have been affected by something like the war on drugs. Um, and at this point in time, there's 113 million people, according to the prison policy, um, initiative, 113 million people as of 2018, who have been affected by or are in some way related to the, the, uh, the justice system. So that's almost one entire row of those children um, when you really think about it, because that's about a third of the population. And it's just absolutely astounding to really have this kind of juxtaposition. Um, yeah. What I also, I, I also found interesting is that this is, I, if this was a field trip, it would have been an example of what we would call like penile uh, spectatorship or penal spectatorship where becoming incarcerated or going like to show like cops or finding anything that has to do with prison is now a show. It's now an art form, but it doesn't really push the questioning of the justice system like your artwork does mm. and your form of photography does. It was just, 
it was just a very interesting juxtaposition that I saw here. It's it's um, so many interesting things about what you said. I mean, one, whether they're students visiting or they're children that are being educated there, it doesn't change your observation about being a, a peer, to appear to be a completely white crowd, right? So, I mean, your point on that is valid, whether they're visiting or they're students there. It makes me think about tours that happen in prison. Um, San Quentin is a place that actually has a lot of tours. And I'm gonna to say tours like this, educational tours that happen where classes of all kinds go in. And I have really mixed feelings about it. Um, one of the things that's interesting at San Quentin is the tours led by uh, mostly incarcerated people. And so they bring them through the prison and, and, and you know, show them different areas and talk to the people. And I find that a lot of people end up volunteering after they do these trips through San Quentin and that they actually do a lot of good. But I also agree with you about the spectatorship, the potential spectatorship and how detrimental it could be. Um, one of the reasons I got involved or I got interested in prison was I heard about a tour that was being offered at a prison in Russia in St. Petersburg called Kresty Prison. And the idea was that people could go through the prison and then end up in a gift shop and buy objects made by the people that were incarcerated there. And I thought that it, it, it so horrified me that there was this idea of tourism going into prisons. So when I went into San Quentin and I found out that they actually did tours in there, that was the that was what was in the back of my mind, how distasteful and disturbing it was. But I did notice at San Quentin that, that it was slightly different, but I'm with you. I still, I, I'm curious what you think about that. Can you see if there's a distinction between um, an educational purpose in, a spec, in, a, in one that's pure um, spectacle? Well, I find that it really comes down to what the intent is, mm -hmm. right? So like if the intention is to, for example, scare straight individuals from becoming incarcerated, it's not necessarily addressing the reasons why people get incarcerated. It's yeah. just stopping you from doing it. Um, you know, luckily I've never seen a, 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 a gift shop that is actually kind of horrifying, unless yeah. of course the proceeds go to the inmates, you yes. know, and then that's completely different, you know, um, because even in our system now, we sometimes we get a job, we get paid a dollar a day to do the job. So anything to um, increase our canteen fund, I guess, would be fun. But I actually was, when I was at um, and CD Jun Cedar Junction, also, you know, formerly known as Walpole, um, a small group of high school students came through. And you do kind of feel like you are on display. Yeah. And there's no Q&A. There's no interaction of why are you here? There are programs in the Massachusetts DOC that offers um, programs where kids can come in and speak to inmates. And I think that kind of um, levels that out a little bit, mm -hmm. that, that, that gut instinct, that kind of gut churning that you get. Um, and kind of evens it out and makes puts the human face to the thing rather than being an actual spectator thing. Yeah. Um, but you do feel you do feel like you're on display and, and, and you're almost like an animal in a zoo in a way. Um, but outside of that, again, it's the the conversations important. You know, yeah. where did I, you know, particularly if these are Boston students who are at risk, mm -hmm. you know, don't make don't make the same mistakes I did because this is where you'll end up being. Yeah. That's totally cool. That's totally cool. But it, at the end of the day, it doesn't also address any of the systemic issues either that we might have. Yeah, yeah. I'd be curious what, if, you, if you were the opportunity, would you do one of the tours at San Quentin to see what it was to, was like, see if it was different or would it be too much? Um, I'm still pretty new home. home. I, mean, I think I've been home for about eight months now. Oh, uh, yeah. But I don't know. Um, seeing those bars in an environment like that might be a little triggering. Yeah. Um, but at the same sense, I wouldn't mind having that sense of camaraderie with the men who are there, yeah. you know, saying, you know, hey, you know, you're not alone. I'm clearly not someone who went home and forgot what it was like. You know, sometimes my heart still bleeds for um, people that I left behind. Yeah, um, in, at Walpole, I'm sorry, I don't remember what it was called, but I, I grew up in Boston and I remember the reputation of Walpole State Prison. Um, San Quentin has something like 3,000 volunteers that go in and out of the prison every year. And I think it makes the atmosphere there quite different. Was there anything like that at Walpole where there were Not volunteers? To my knowledge, um, there probably were. Um, nowadays, it's more of a transitional location. So once mm -hmm. you get sentenced, you go to Walpole, then they classify you, and then they send you off to the next facility uh, where you'll be okay. at. Um, so there's usually a high turnover at yeah. that facility now. There is a federal unit um, where there's uh, other individuals who are doing fed sentences. They sit mm -hmm. there. 
Um, and I think there's one block of um, prisoners who stay there and work the facility uh, as their labor force. But outside of that, I don't think there's really anything long lasting um, mm -hmm. as far as volunteers are concerned. I myself though have benefited very much from volunteer work um, by individuals coming into the facility programs like um, the Landmark Foundation they oh. do, do the leadership and transformational thinking, which is mental remapping to try mm. to help you cope and make better decision and better choices. Phenomenal individuals, phenomenal individuals, hearts of gold. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just great to be able to, and I did Toastmasters for a number of years. So we have volunteers who come and participate in that. And again, phenomenal, you know, these are people who help us feel that we're still human. Yeah. Um, and that would always kind of, uplift us to deal and have that strength to be able to deal with the inhumane treatments that we sometimes get. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of I, the things I really believe in is this idea of one way to lower the wall is to have more programs where inside and outside people are working together and not necessarily as volunteers, but one of the things I've strived for is working together as professional colleagues. And so it, it, it isn't about just going in and giving it's about going in and giving and getting and the people inside giving and getting too so it's much more reciprocal mm -hmm. and hopefully hopefully in some ways mirrors what happens when people are outside that that you're you know you're with colleagues you know i think that's a really beautiful thing and I, and I wish that more prisons could do that yeah there's definitely a fantastic component of that shared experience because not a lot of people know what a facility is like and that's what's so interesting about these photographs unfortunately they're 30 years 40 years outdated um and 50 years in some cases yeah. but because they just don't allow photography anymore but there's a reason for that as well um and having that interaction can help change the stereotypes and the and the perspective of those who are free world individuals and those who are incarcerated mm -hmm. that not everyone who's incarcerated is a bad person some people make mistakes they make poor decisions and they're paying their debt to society um, and should be afforded all the rights and privileges of being a free citizen once they're released absolutely and, <laughs> right yes. so once you have that understanding in that um that understanding at the grassroots level amongst the regular population then reintegration will be all that much more easy mm -hmm. um, for an individual who's been incarcerated. You know, I can, I can, I'm considered to have what was known as a baby bit, you know, because I only had a few years in, but there's some individuals who I know are finishing 20 years, 25 years soon. Yeah. You know, these, the advent of the cell phone wasn't even, you know, it was still in suitcases back right. then, you know, right. so, um, and it's just, I worry for them um, on how they, they'll be able to reintegrate with all the changes. Ryan selected one that follows up on that conversation, actually, about your collaborative approach to teaching. Mm. I was wondering, how did you choose which photos you wanted to use for part one of your project? And did you have an idea of what types of thoughts or feelings you might have wanted to invoke with each picture? Yes, that's a really great question. So I started going into the prison teaching a history of photography class. and, and one of the things I really believe about photography is that photography is a bridge to conversation. And because photography is such a ubiquitous medium, people feel very comfortable with it. And they, and the way I talk about it is that when you look at a photograph and you interpret it, you are, you are pulling on your own lived experience to understand and interpret the photograph. And the way you talk about it becomes in many ways an autobiography. And that was, so that was one of the things I, I practiced teaching in that class and <clears throat> when i stopped teaching and, vol and started volunteering the media lab that's when i actually worked on this project so the way it worked was um i just put the word out there to guys in san quentin that i wanted to start this project and was anyone interested in doing it with me and so people volunteered to be part of it some of them were my former students um, that were still incarcerated at San Quentin and some were men in the media lab and some were men I hadn't met before. And so we met as a group, we talked about the project um, and, and what I was hoping to do. And then I had to get permission from the prison to bring images inside the prison because the administration is very worried about the power of photographs as they should be because photographs are incredibly insightful um, expressions of what people are experiencing. So first I would get a bunch of images cleared, say like 10, 20, 
30 images. Then I would bring them into the media lab, put them out on the table, and the guys would just look at them and select the ones that spoke to them. So there were about 12 men that were working on this project. So they would, <laughs> they would select their images and then they would debate with other people if someone took the one they wanted. So they had, um, there was a, a system of, of selection done in, in multiple ways. First, by what the prison would let me bring in, and then by the men themselves deciding which image they wanted to write on. Yeah, so that's how the process worked. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I should say, if you, Ryan, if you're interested in, in, in collaboration and, and, and how those things work, we had so many discussions about um, should the prints be printed on glossy paper or matte paper? Should we use pencils or pens or color ink? Um, at first, I really wanted everything to be uniform and I have just a pension for, for graphite on photographic paper, but through conversations that ended up getting um, trumped by other people. So if you look at the different annotated photographs, you'll see that some are in color, some are black and white. Um, and so it was really up to the men to figure out what they wanted to, to use to make their um, annotated photograph come to life. In light of the project, I saw that there was um, a lot of zine content that Black and Pink publishes and that there was even a partnership with the Prison Book Project. So after hearing about the photo mapping um, and the activities like that at San Quentin, I was wondering if this influenced the types of mediums you would like to see or even possibly have Black and Pink um, work with going forward? Actually, we were just brainstorming recently um, about a way that we can help for our own funding so that we can help uh, facilitate and, you know, run the organization, but also help those who are incarcerated and our free world members. Um, and one of the ways we're looking at is possibly having submissions from our members on the inside submitted to us, um, and then we'll vote or decide some way or another, and then have them printed on shirts or cards, pins, other uh, you know, avenues of being able to express that artwork and actually show the, actual, the, the insane amount of talent that can actually be found inside. You know, I've seen some phenomenal pencil work, just graphite pencil in, in the motions that, oh, it's insane. They'll take a photograph of a regular person, like, oh, can you draw this picture of my daughter? And then he'll just, almost like a photocopy, just with graphite, it's incredible. Um, and being able to, you know, and use that as a way as fundraising tools, have, pe you know, people um, maybe, uh, you know, purchase these items or uh, auction these items off to help generate that revenue. And in, in, in of course, the person whose work is being used, they'll get a, uh, a don't, uh, they'll get dropped off in their canteen fund as well. Um, something well, that's I'm, pretty I'm sizable. Very, I'm very interested in that the, um, that the objects that you're considering producing are um, dress, things to wear. Um, can you talk more about wh why um, t-shirts and pins and things that one wears are, are, are what seems appealing for uh, showcasing this artwork? Well, that's really what it is, it's showcasing, it's visibility, it's a, ta a talking point. Um, to have someone come up to you, oh, that's a great shirt, or that's really nice, where'd you get it from? And then they can, then the individual who purchased the item or is wearing the item can then have that conversation. And then that conversation just blossoms into uh, more outreach work on our behalf. So I guess in a way you can say it's almost like advertising, but also it's also getting that human element out of it, just like with the, for, for, for the photography. It's because like, again, how many people would know the amount of talent that an incarcerated individual would have, unless if we bring it out into the open. Um, there's in the Prison Nation book, there's a whole selection of soaps, soap work. I've participated once making a box out of carved soap. Um, so even maybe something on, the, on, on those lines, depending on the facility, some facilities don't let you mail those things home. Um, but streetwear is a great way to get the message out. It's a great way to to showcase what we're really about. And start conversations too. Like you said, like you wear, people ask you about it. And I love the idea too, that it's, it's not an object that's just going to be kept in a home. It's going to go out into the world and hopefully have, you know, as I said, like start more conversations. That was a great question, Ryan. Thank you. Well, I want to thank each of you um, for participating today. I appreciate that you shared your insights and experiences, and I encourage everyone watching to visit the Davis to see this important exhibition, Prison Nation, which will be on view until June 5th, 2022.
Thank you. Thank you.